Welcome to Command Your Morning. Uh, my name is Moredi Wanjao, Pastor M. I'm the senior pastor of Mavuno Church, movement, a movement of churches that is headquartered here in Nairobi, Kenya, spread out in different nations of the world. And I'm so excited to be bringing God's word to you. Last week, we began a two-part series uh, from the book of Esther, talking about some of the challenges that we face in our nation. We're calling this two-part series, A Nation in Trouble. And we saw how easy it is, as we look through the book of the first chapter of Esther, to see how easy it is for our leaders to drag us into their personal issues, so that they become our own issues, and we end up hating and hurting one another over things we were never involved in shaping. And we learned that we must never allow ourselves to get dragged into those personal issues. In fact, we must resist that temptation at all costs, and we must also resist the opposite temptation, which is to ignore our nation's politics, that we must engage uh, as, as Kenyans, and we must exercise our spiritual authority and pray for this nation. You see, politics will affect you whether you choose to ignore it or not. Politics is like gravity. You know, you can walk around saying, I don't care about gravity. I don't believe in gravity. But you know what? When you encounter gravity from the wrong direction, it will affect you whether you care about it or not. You, talk, you walk on a tall building and not care and you fall off, trust me, it will hurt you. It's the same way that politics works. Whether you acknowledge it or not, it affects your life. The politics of this nation affects us in very direct and indirect ways. From the availability of jobs for you and your relatives, to the price of food, to the security of your area. All these things will have to do with politics, the potholes in the roads outside your house. Uh, all these things have to do with politics. And even the politics of other nations is important. You know, when Russia invaded Ukraine a little while back, we may have thought it was far away. It was unconnected. I mean, who's ever even traveled to those countries? But you know, right now, many Kenyans have understood that it has a direct impact on the cost of living, on the prices of, of basic materials in our nation because of the politics of a nation far away. And that's why we not only need to know, but we must be involved in and participate in our nation's politics as a people. And the title of my message today is on an issue that is really central to our politics as this nation. And that it's about the deception of tribalism. The deception of tribalism. And I want to define tribalism as I begin. Because tribalism is a belief in the superiority of one's tribe and the tendency to view life from that perspective. So here you are, you believe that your tribe or your, your grouping, your ethnic grouping is superior to others and then you arrange your life according to that worldview that everything are, are for, from you perceives from that belief. And today we want to look at this issue of tribalism from the book of Esther chapter 3. And again, I'm going to read a, a longer section from verse 1 to 15 making a few comments. As we go. Are you ready? Let's look at God's word, Esther chapter 3. And here's what it says. It says, After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. So, so what happens is a new character is introduced, uh, this Haman guy, and he's not been a subject in the story so far. Nobody knows who he is. Uh, we're not told why the king promoted him over other nobles. He's just introduced and he's elevated even higher than the, the seven-member cabinet that we saw in chapter 1. He's pretty much a prime minister. Uh, his authority is only second to the king. And this elevation comes with certain privileges. We can see in verse 2. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Now let me break this down a little bit. A new government of, of appointee. Uh, this guy has become a powerful uh, official of the government. He has all the perks that come with it. He has a new limousine. He has a flag. He has a motorcade. He has, he has some uh, people in front of him, some guys who clear the traffic for him. He has some bodyguards. Uh, he's, he likes driving now on the wrong side of the road. He's never caught in traffic. I mean, it's not stuff that we as Kenyans would identify with, right? But there's this guy who decides that he's not impressed. He's not impressed and he will not bow down to this Mueshimiwa. And the guy is enraged. Our official is enraged. Verse 6 tells us, Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. 
Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Zaxus. I mean, Haman was angry at Mordecai. Mordecai is the one person who wouldn't kneel. But Haman decides to take it out on those people, the whole people that he's related to, to kill an entire tribe. And he hatches a deadly port, plot to destroy the Jews. And we see in verse 7, in the 12th year of King Zaxus, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the poor, that is the lot, was cast in the...